All right. I'd like to welcome everybody listening now and in the future. Um, this is a talk by Robin Grill on developmental needs. Actually, I talked Robin into doing this, actually. <laughs> I, I just want to name and own that. Um, I really love this topic and I love the, the work that Robin has done on understanding developmental needs and the stages that we all go through um, to grow. And his new book is so good, This Inner Child Journeys, How Our Children Grow Us Up, is so good at helping us identify our, our these needs that maybe didn't get met and then how we can get them met as adults. So I'll just read your short bio here, Robin, and then we'll get started. Mm -hmm. Robin Grill is a Sydney-based psychologist and parenting educator. His articles on parenting and child development have been widely published. Hold on, admitting someone. Uh, widely published and translated in Australia and around the world. Robin's first book, Parenting for a Peaceful World, received international acclaim and led to a speaking engagements around Australia, USA, UK, Canada, Indonesia, New Zealand, and Hong Kong. His second book, Heart to Heart Parenting, is also available in German and Korean. Robin's work is animated by his belief that humanity's future is largely dependent on the way we collectively relate to our children. Inner Child Journeys, How Our Children Grow Us Up is his newest title. Robin's experiential, skills-based, and informational parenting courses have helped many people to embrace parenting as a transformative personal growth journey. Drawing from 28 years clinical experience and from leading edge neuropsychological research, Robin's seminars and courses focus on healthy emotional development for children, as well as parents, while building supportive, cooperative parenting communities. Okay, that's good for now. Take it away, Robin. Thank you, Kate. I was going to say when when you mentioned to begin with that the talk was your idea, and and um, and I'll share that you didn't exactly drag me here kicking and screaming. Um, because <laughs> I'm a bit of a pushover. You say talk about this stuff, and I go, oh, okay. I love talking about it. This is I like talking about this at any old time. I find that the material very very exciting. Um, and um, just while you were talking there too, a um, little bit of news that, that the way that I framed the inner child work is um, uh, as a training for health practitioners. It's now, I'm now working with people online in India, parent educators in, in India. Um, and gee, that's exciting. It's so interesting, challenging, and very, very exciting. And, and you mentioned some of the kind of countries that I visited and, and um, delivered my workshops to. One of the things that really starts to become apparent is how, you know, there's the initial difficulty, the, the big blind spots of bringing this kind of work to a, a culture that I'm ignorant about, essentially. I'm a, I'm a baby in that culture. I don't know what I'm stepping into. And, um, and you know, crossing cultures, you're confronted by people who see the world through different lenses. And um, uh, that's always it's a tremendous challenge, but a, a, a challenge that I love uh, for all its kind of perils. And each time I find, and now India is kind of a new frontier for me, um, each time I find that there, there's a sort of a le levels and closer to the surface was incredibly different and unique. The deeper you go, the more there's a unitary theme. Um, and um, it's this exhilarating moment to find through the very, very unfamiliar the infinitely familiar, the universality of our, our deepest kind of longings and urges and the sort of the, the shared neurobiology, the shared humanity that just crosses, it knows no oceans or national boundaries or language difference. That's a really, really thrilling moment, you know, calling out across the canyon and there's a familiar person on the other side sooner or later. Um, so much to say about 
the developmental frame for the healing journey. And, and I guess that we're all here because we, we harbor uh, a, some kind of passion for this whole thing of growth, personal growth, relational growth, healing, and um, in pursuit of human potential, deepening our, opening our hearts, deepening our aliveness and our, our vitality in the world. And um, that's a huge shared pursuit. To give that a, a language that puts it in a developmental story, a developmental frame, um, brings with it what I think are some really, really exciting uh, ramifications. And um, as a psychologist and a person that began my personal growth journey with encounter groups and the whole personal growth movement of the 1980s, you know, I was quite young. I was about 20 when all of that began. I started having therapy and eventually kind of stumbled into completing my psychology degree. Blah, blah to all of that. That's not how healing the image or the frame of what healing means, that's not how I first absorbed it. And there is a load of kind of a, a, a presumption of struggle and effort that I've always kind of sensed in the game of healing and personal growth. Um, often uh, are directly stated or at least a, a kind of a unwritten subtext of getting over things. You know, the, the, even when it's not stated directly in a lot of the kind of the personal growth marketplace, there's the presumption of self-improvement, um, getting above things, getting over, transcending, getting you know whoever you are however you are right now that's not the real you that's just a, a version of you and it's not a particularly good one right ditch that because we got a better you coming along and you will be imagining what that better you is there's a there's which i think embeds an implicit shaming in the entire quest um, you could be on that treadmill for an eternity, trying to be a better person in a way that devalues parts of you that somehow there's an agreement, a social agreement that that's not a great thing about you. The part of you that gets angry, the part of you that gets frightened, the part of you that thinks small. Um, and over years, I started to feel like, hang on a minute. This is kind of insulting. There's a um, downgrading um, that is written into so many so schools of psychology of, um, you know, irrational. Your reactions are irrational. They might be, but what troubles me is how often the word irrational carries an energy of judgment, of put down. Um, of wrongness, irrational, bad, rational, good, um, angry, frightened, ashamed, bad, calm, good. There's a gigantic marketplace now where calm is good. I mean, I know calm is good and, and I love visiting that place inside myself. I would love a lot more, frankly. But the devaluation, the right, of calm is good versus our emotional re responses and reactions are mm, okay within a particular bandwidth, right? <laughs> and then there's the judgments that we have that are incessant. Self-judgment, oh my God, that's like a, like a, relentless train and judgments of each other judgments of the world the um 
the kind of the voices, you know, and it's an amphitheater full of voices that we carry on up here, usually around the head with, uh, with judgments, positive judgments as well as, as negative judgments. And that the kind of intermarriage of spiritual Eastern spiritualities, some Western spiritualities and kind of popular psychologies tend to carry with them this sort of admonition um, to stop judging. That's just your judgment. Get over your judgment, right? There's always a kind of um, like a vertical morality where, you know, be above and beyond, you know? So no wonder we create what, what Carl Jung beautifully named as the shadow. These great noises and sounds and urges and impulses inside ourselves that we run from nonstop. Um, now that may not be the intention of the messages. Nonetheless, in the communities that I speak to, the, the weight of the personal growth message feels to me like loaded with shame and an attack upon the what is interesting inside the cosmos of ourselves as if we're looking at the sky saying well that's a good star but that's a shitty star i want to get rid of that shitty star and i want to get more of the good stars that's a crappy color get rid of that we'll keep the milky way we'll get, get rid of the supernova you know um I'm, I'm aggrieved by how that languaging reduces interest and fascination. And then starting to see the whole game of healing and personal growth through the lens of development lifted great burdens from me and from people that I work with. And that's the framework that I want to share about. I want to go into some depth with it because I think, you know, most people say, yeah, I know it's about development, but what does that mean? Come on, let's, let's open that up. What does it mean? And what are the implications for your relationships with the people that matter to you in your life day to day? What does this developmental frame mean? Let's start by telling the kind of story. Now, I'm not going to say this is a fact. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to offer reams of research. Um, I will ask your indulgence because from this moment for the rest of the talk, I'm just for shorthand, I'm going to say, look, this is how, I, how it is. Frankly, I don't know how it is. How could I? I'm a tiny little being with a peanut sized brain and two eyes and a complicated life. I'm wounded, you know, I'm great and I'm hurt. You know, how the hell should I know how things are? But I, this is, I'm calling it how I see it. And you just, please be free. Just um, try it on is what I'm asking. Try on the stuff that I'm saying, but be the master of what you absorb and what you, you know, it's up to you. And, um, digest it in the way that you see fit. I'm just going to say this is what it is because it's easier, right? No proof of any of it. I guess my experience. Um, and so we tend to come to the concern with healing or growth development through conflict, through stuckness, through hurt. It's, um, it, it does happen, but it's incredibly rare that somebody shows up to a therapist and said, God, I'm enjoying my life. I'm so in love with people in my life and me just enjoying the challenges. I just thought I'd show up here and see what you got, you know, in case I can make things even bigger. You know, I think that happens, but it's usually kind of a death's door. 
when 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 we're when it hurts a lot uh, when things are breaking. Um, so conflict or stuckness, stuckness of the immobility of how to move towards what we what we long for. And um, and what psychologists love to say negative thinking. They love to call it negative thinking. And I mean the it's difficult not to read a value judgment in that. Isn't it? It's 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 very easy. We're we're also we carry so much shame that it's hard to hear that languaging without feeling like, oh, negative thinking, that's bad. Um, and who decides which of you thinking is negative? Let's find out where all of this happens. The stuff that people label as irrational or negative thoughts, you know, th those emotional overreactions and under underreactions that we have to one another. While we yell at our children, while we punish, why we, why, why we sometimes hate our partners, why we hate ourselves, why we want to express something and can't bear to it because we're you know, riddled with terror that doesn't seem to make sense of the present moment. Shame, all of those things. Well, here's what I want to offer. The, the the conflicted states that we wish to get rid of, you could have another, instead of trying to amputate that internal turmoil and replace it with a better one, that's what you do with cars when they break down. You're not a car. We could have a different relationship to that, which is to be very, very interested. That's already different to acting out blindly. If I'm, you know, filled with, you know, uh, anger that feels out of my control or I'm thinking really, you know, judgmentally about people, whatever it is, I, I could, to make life safe, to take some ownership, begin by just you know, removing myself from those I might injure and finding intimate time with me, but become very interested in those turmoils as a signal of something. Instead of kind of replacing negative thinking, how quick are we to do that? With a positive affirmation, I mean, that stuff sells a lot more books than mine because <laughs> um, it appears simple. We're a computer, replace the programming and all will go well. It's so seductive and so tragic because Jesus, nobody goes to see movies where everything goes well. We are attracted to movies and, and books and stories where, because we learn through conflict, we are, we are attracted to that. We don't want to get burnt by it, but we want to be, to have a bridge of some kind of connection to that. We, we are, we're curious. And, and I want to say, trust the curiosity of, of the spirit. What if we were to sit with ourselves then and say, I'm going to listen to that judgmental voice like you would listen to a hurt child, you know? And, and the words that come up are pretty horrible sometimes, filled with hatred and jealousy and all kinds of stuff. What if I treat that as a signal, as a signal to something? And here's how it goes. We, it's because of body memory, and this is the new, neuropsychology that has really unpacked this, explained the, the flesh engine that underlies the phenomenon of body memory in which our bodies 
are vulnerable to re-experiencing sensations, feelings, flavors from all the way back from last year to all the way back to uh, at the latest, the third trimester in the womb, which is why we like to talk about the inner child. For me, the inner child is a metaphor for really for body memory that there are triggers in my environment that push a button and suddenly to some degree, parts of me are re-experiencing emotions or physical sensations of things that I've lived, often very beautiful things. And the, the examples are infinite. You hear a song and that was the song you, 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 you danced with your someone you were in love with and suddenly you're back there, you're transported and a part of you is 17 years old again. And that comes up. Or you see your baby's little feet and that's a trigger. All sensory input has the potential to trigger body memory, even in the absence of the narrative memory to, that goes with it. That's why often we're flooded with emotions that we don't know the story for. That's when the self-punishment begins. It often begins with the word, why? Why am I reacting like this? I wanna say, wow, ouch, why aren't you interested in that reaction? Instead of wrapping yourself on the knuckles. And there's an evolutionary purpose in this. Of course, we are called to re-experience bits, sometimes huge bits of childhood. Partly because in, in when our body taps into memories of love, affection, encouragement, immediately there's a flow on effect. Our bodies want to pass that on. That's part of the beautiful evolutionary story of how the, the support, love, joy we've received from our elders just are, we can't help. There's an urge to bring that to others, young people. We, we constantly tapping in, we're like sending the bucket down the well, tapping into that resource, that body memory that we carry forever. It never goes away. Most of the time we do that without the narrative recall. It's just a beautiful process that we are spectators to. I see a crying child and my, my, my attention just wants to go to that person on a good day when I'm having a good day. My hands want to offer holding and I don't need to necessarily consciously know my body is a little bit recalling how that was done for me. It just happens. But we recall also pain. We recall pain, terror, frustration, horror, absolute abject helplessness. We recall the sensations of nightmare, the sensations of emptiness, deep disappointment. And it's the greatest trigger for those recalls are relationships, human relationships. The reason I wrote the book in the parenting frame is because probably nobody triggers us like our children, but it doesn't end there. It, it's, it, it's humans. If we had another hour, we could talk about how all things can be a trigger. It's, but let's just narrow it to that. Our relationships, constantly triggering. Your partner shouts and a part of you goes back to the helplessness of being shouted at by your dad and how you were paralyzed and you lost your sense of agency. And psychoanalysts would, you know, used to language it by saying, oh, you married your father. 
it, it's nowhere near that simple and nowhere near that absolute or total, not even close. But there's a moment where partially a part of you tra travels back seemingly in time to an earlier helplessness in which something needed to happen. Now, we can suffer from that. We can say it's irrational. We can try to stop that happening. Or we can see the evolutionary value in those regressions, which is, I suggest the latter is a much, much happier and self-forgiving and ultimately far more empowering way to go. There's a message in that. Um, I now think about Bruce Perry. If you guys have heard of Bruce Perry, because it's a thing that he said, um, there's many things he said that I kind of, I, I'm in love with, and I'd like to paint them on my walls, but he is one of them. And I, I will not be able to quote him verbatim. You know, Bruce Perry is the infant traumatologist, super cool dude, American child psychiatrist, and neuro this and everything like that. He tours the world, um, written some brilliant books, brilliant, brilliant. And um, I'd say right now is probably the leading, if not the, but one of the top leaders of helping us to understand the how trauma affects. And of course, we are used to thinking of trauma as sudden events. That's a very small part of trauma, very small. Most trauma is not event related, it's relational. It's not about the alcoholic, the violent father. Those are the obvious photographable things that deserve attention. But most of what we suffer from psychologically um, states that went on for years. Um, in, environments that we lived in. And not always a thing that happens to you quite often the absence of a necessary developmental nutrient, right? People get enormously, this is huge psychological problems with intimacy, close relationships. And they go, well, nothing bad happened to me as a child, but that's not the thing. It's some of the good things you needed failed to happen. Your mom and dad were nice. Everybody was nice. No one shouted, no one punished you but there were some necessary things that weren't happening for you. And this is where understanding the biological, psychological, bottom line, core developmental needs, the emotional, psychological, developmental needs. You can't say psychological without saying neurological, by the way, right? Um, everything psychological happens neurologic. It's all has this, this, uh, engine in our and the brain starts here and ends at the at the soles of your feet by the way it's the whole body long story for that what did bruce perry say that i wanted to share with you the healing is sequential it's completing a sequence and that every developmental stage some very new starting from before birth through all the way to 25 years of age end of adolescence some very distinct stages of development that have specific developmental needs, just like your physiological development. At this age, you need to learn to sit up. At this age, you need to learn to stand up. At this age, you need to learn to eat solids. At this stage, you need to learn complex spoken language. Do you see that? It's the same with our emotional neuro-emotional, neuropsychological development stages. And this is what needs to happen then. I love Bruce Perry for saying the next thing, that we come to the world with the biological expectation of what should happen. And I'm gonna call that a developmental should. I need to assert that word should because for very, very good reason, you've heard a trillion people say it a trillion times, don't should things. Stop saying should, because it gets you into a trap. I understand that, I believe in it, I agree with it. Uh, 
and don't don't say you shouldn't say should either. Um, you should breathe, okay, or you're going to die. Um, there's few exceptions to that. If you're one of these yogis that spend 50 years learning how to live without breathing, good on you. But that's not who you are right now. Um, you should eat. You should, you know, children should be hugged. There are shoulds. There are developmental shoulds. If you don't get this, it's over. It's the same thing for every organism. Except, okay, a couple more things to say. First of all, this is what I love about what Bruce Perry said, that we come into each of those stages with a, with a, uh, I call it a developmental template. The body senses when you're getting what you should. And when you don't get what you should get, or you get the wrong thing, that doesn't come for free. It doesn't. Not in childhood. You don't just go, okay, wow, this hurts, or this is very disappointing, and then move on. That's not what happens. That's not our design. Our design is that we must create an adaptation to not getting what we should have gotten in terms of the core developmental needs. And I'm not talking about, oh, mum didn't, I wanted a little racing car and I didn't get that racing car. I'm talking about core developmental needs, not kind of trivial disappointments. Um, Bruce Perry said, children are not resilient. Stop telling ourselves and each other that children must be resilient. And then we, you know, how do you get resilient? You teach, you know, you teach the 10 bullet points of resiliency in an ethics class in school and then move on. We're not resilient. What we are is far more interesting than that. We are as children adaptive. So children, all of us as children, we're capable of living through enormous shocks. I mean, it's, Miraculous, the things that we live through, just huge disappointments, terrifying things, abuse, neglect, you know, complete lack of, I mean, people in my work who lived in families that had no sense of humor at all. Nobody laughed, you know, just um, families that never showed anger, families that never showed affection. Um, yeah, it's all kinds of, the stuff that we live through, we bounce back. And you'll hear a lot of people say, well, my baby had a terrible night. I just left my baby crying alone in a room. Must be okay because I came to the baby in the morning and baby's, you know, very happy to see me and smiling. See, nothing broken. No. We bounce back, but we don't bounce, bounce back unchanged. We bounce back with an adaptation. We're not thinking about it. It's not conscious. We don't say, oh, now I'm three. And what I now need, the developmental should, what I now need is freedom to express my emotions, freedom to run away a bit from mum and dad so I can explore the world and very clear interpersonal boundaries of behavior without punishment. You know, you're three year old, <laughs> you're not thinking that, but there's a developmental template in our bodies, in our neurology, the wisdom of the cells that will adapt, will need to react and adapt to those things being missing. So we do bounce back, but we bounce back with some changes. And the changes that happen in childhood and adolescence and babyhood are powerful and, and difficult to change back later on in life because they're embedded in webs of synapse and gut biology to give us a set of powerful automatic responses to the kind of world that we seem to be confronted with. If I'm born into a family where there's a lot of yelling and conflict and slamming doors, 
I will bounce back, but I better bounce back with a readiness to fight or to flee, for example. So that my wiring needs to be a short fuse. Because look, look at my evidence. I'm living in a violent world. There you get a, a, a very jumpy, angry, explosive person. That's an adaptation. Um, so metaphorically, I'll go back to the image of the inner child. We carry the inner baby, inner child, inner adolescent. The, the thing that I find beautiful about the evolutionary design is that the, what the inner child didn't get, let's say in, in this particular stage, there are five essential things we're supposed to get. And we only got three of them and the other two, we only got a little bit that part of the body, which is the inner child, never stops asking for the rest of our lives. If you die at 120, the night before you, you die, you're still subject potentially to being triggered, you know, at least a little bit, and to the call of the inner child. Saying, do you know what, people, I'm still waiting to get what I didn't get when I was seven and I should have got it then. And in terms of the core developmental need, it never ends. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So we're triggered by our relationships, emotions come up, or you know, even paralysis comes up, something that is that's a signal. You know, even the the judgments, the, the, the thinking that happens up here, you know, why are women like this? Why are men men so violent? You know, people always this, people always that. The world is so corrupt. We know all of that stuff. Those are all signals. That's the, you can trace, you can trace that back. If you listen to those inner voices and go, okay, who's, who's crying out right now in here? That has meaning. We go into the body. This is, uh, I mean, when, when I'm doing my trainings, there is, there is a dance around this, a beautiful method. I experience it like a dance going into our bodies and tuning and asking through body sensation. The inner child speaks through body sensation and cannot tell a lie. This is the value. I think you're starting to see what I mean, that being interested in our irrationalities, in our so-called negative thinking. Um, and invariably, you land in a place where your inner child is saying, I feel helpless. There's a, there's a developmental need that is incomplete or hasn't even been met at all. Should I give some examples now? Um, You know, somebody that had a lot of birth trauma and who's coming to the you know, outside, we're already in the world, but coming to outside of mum's womb, coming to that first autonomy of existence, separateness. If that was a great shock, a great splitting, as it is for a lot of people, that, that the developmental need was to be very wanted and very sensitively and respons responsibly received. You can see what Bruce Perry is talking about that in, in, in a newborn baby's movement, what the eyes look for, how the eyes can lock in to eye contact with, with a mom at exactly the distance from breast to mom's head can't focus on anything else. You know, the way that baby's body start potentially to crawl up mom's belly, the way that the body knows how to latch with just a little bit of assistance. Um, the way that the baby's body responds and, 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 and the heart and the breath rhythm falls into a healthy rhythm via the skin to skin contact. There's this developmental template that looks like a periscope for the right nutrient for that moment, for that stage. 
that's the same in every stage. Fight or flight is unavailable to the newborn child. So the adaptation when those things aren't met or even worse, when there is a violent kind of experience of childbirth, the adaptation is dissociative. And then there's a wisdom in that, that you know, because you don't survive if, if, if it hurts too much. Beautiful wisdom and it's based on, on endogenous opioids, etc. There's an anesthetic device that happens that enables you to not be there for the worst of the experience. But then when that happens in a very powerful way or when it happens a lot, the nervous system says, I know what I need to do with this. I need to be good at dissociating. The world is telling me I'm in a violent place, shocking place where I'm forgotten. I will be forgotten. I will be abandoned. But I would like to live a long life. Thank you very much. I better get good at dissociating. What the nervous system practices a lot, it becomes an expert too. And there's a web of support to prepare that response well. And, um, you know, I'm somebody that dissociates very quickly. I go up into my head a lot, a lot. I always have. Um, you know what a relief it is? What a relief it is that I remember as a younger man being awfully frustrated with that and, and, and ashamed of that part of me, the part of me that intellectualizes or daydreams instead of engaging in the present moment, deeply ashamed of that part of me. And as I look more deeply at the developmental framework of healing, the ahas that come with that, and, and more and more I'm thinking, what a gift, you know, what a brilliance of the human body to know how to do that. And just as well that my body became expert at, at that self anesthetic thing that it doesn't ask for my permission, it just goes. Um, it saved me from many, many things. You know, also when you dissociate a lot, you think a lot and then you practice thinking a lot. That's useful when you want to write a book. So there's always an unexpected, um, often an unexpected, unexpected gift, an unexpected vocation that comes from the wounding, by the way. I'd love to do a talk about that one day. How our wounds often drive our careers. I love that story. Kate, one day you can drag me into it. But then not just that, when I notice, I oh, look, I've, I've really, I've left the building. Then to, to go in, what's the part of me that potentially the baby in me that just got frightened and what's the developmental nutrient that this inner baby is looking for? It, 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 it often, the answer that comes up, my body tells me it's about touch. It's about removing myself physically from an emotionally unsafe situation or an overwhelming thing. It's, um, it's to speak in metaphor, it's, you know, be interested in the reaction, in the so-called irrational thing. And it's like saying, baby, what do you need to, to the inner baby? And when you ask, the body speaks in images or, um, you know, I like using, I like, um, I listen to body sensations. I, I help people how to do this. And you can, you can get a match. You can say, is it this? And the body will say, uh, uh, is it that that you need? Uh, uh, is it that when you get a match, there's an instant change in the body sensation, an instant signal that that's what the inner child, as it were, was calling for. Um, same with all of the ongoing developmental stages. Now, if what happens is that when we don't consider the inner child, all of these incompletely met needs that we all carry something, some wounding from childhood and that your body knows, you know, your body reacts to 
what should have happened that didn't for you. If we don't consider that developmental need that we carry in adulthood, what happens is that that overloads our relationships massively in so many obvious ways. You know, the baby that was never allowed to cling because babies should be clingy. Babies should, I'm talking the developmental should, babies should be entirely dependent. That when you say, ah, someone answers your, ah, or at least tries to. That's the, the stage of the, the body's looking for the right to express need and for your needs to matter to someone else across the interpersonal gap and to be shown that your needs matter. Um, at least most of the time. I know that parents have their own, you know, no parent meets the need all the time, none but at least most of the time. So that's that stage. And so we cling. And then when that cling becomes a desperate clinging as a survival tool, when we feel that, you know, for whatever reason, mom and dad aren't available, mom's depressed, mom's too wounded, mom has zero support in her life, so she can't make it for whatever those reasons are. And the cling, the clinging behavior two things happen. We either, we add incredible despair to the clinging as if we, we stay stuck in screaming for mummy um, for good reason, or other people will react to the non-response, the trauma of non-response or very delayed response. Other people react by, uh, you know, the, the nervous system just shuts down there's a collapse hormonally that's those are very two different situations there's a collapse of from the from the bodily need for connection it's not just milk by the way breast milk it's connection contact from when that need arises it then starts to lead to a collapse of the reaching out behavior the need doesn't connect to the nerves that feed the arms, to the nerves that feed the throat, to go, ah, to the diaphragm that makes you, ah, that, that you know, for, for the sake of your survival, that connection breaks down and there's a collapse. But you see those things in our adult behaviors. And then we call it personality. It's not personality, it's history, it's your story. There are those that cling so much to relationships that we suffocate each other. And there is those that never reach out, the, the, the compulsively self-reliant, uh, that, that, that therefore never get to experience the, the, the thrill, the, the bliss of, ex, of um, intimacy. Here's, a, here's another one that the obsession with freedom to the point of self-entitlement. That's massive in our society, absolutely massive. It's my child, I can do what I want to my child. Don't you dare interfere with that. It's my block of land, I can do what I want with it. It's my dog, I can leave dog shit on the footpath. Um, I have a corporation. It's my right to control government with donations. Um, how many examples can you think of that? The moment that there's any regulation politically, there is a chorus of screaming voices saying, you know, nanny state, how dare you? How dare you? In that, I can hear either the screaming toddler that was shamed and punished and sent to his or her room, where the, the toddler years from, you know, I'm thinking right now between three and five, the most important thing is freedom. That's when freedom is a developmental need. And toddlers need for healthy development 
to be given boundaries that are, you know, with punishment and shame. Parents that know how to say no, and I don't want you to do that, with assertion rather than with violence. And as toddlers, we need people, you know, we have tantrums. All toddlers have tantrums. The body doesn't know how to contain emotion and put it to language. We need the developmental nutrient. What should happen developmentally is a kind of a holding presence that is centered enough to allow the tantrum to move through and then offer support and then teach language. But without the shaming and the punishment, it's critically important. Now, toddlers are punished enormously and shamed and the things people say about toddlers are, are horrendous and so are adolescents. The, the stage where the, there's a developmental need to form opinions. And I know that the, those opinions will be irritating to the adults, but then we, 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 we put them down. We, um, we shame them, we reject them, we shout over them, all kinds of stuff. I'm just giving you these examples just to demonstrate to you how different the needs are, different developmental needs, so different themes according to each stage. And then when those needs are not met or when we're given the wrong thing, what the developmental shouldn't, the de developmental should nots that we get, we overload our relationships as adults. We demand things that people can't give, such as, let, you know, I demand the right to run my corporation in a way that destroys the oceans. And up yours, if you, if you should have the temerity to make a law that says, you don't want me to do that. Um, the, you can see in our culture, in our economics and our politics, the exact hyper grandiosity of a three or four year old. Developmental arrest. You can't go to that person and say, do some positive thinking, mate. This is addressed at the level of development. Somebody did horrifically shame and punish that person for being what a normal toddler is. Toddlers are those people that are superheroes because they are flirting. This is a developmental need. They are flirt, just like little puppy dogs fight all day. They're, they're developing skill, relationship skill. Toddlers are flirting with how to handle power how to have a strong voice. The only way to learn something is by getting it wrong a million times. The only way to learn. So toddlers will make a mess, or scream, tantrum, blah, blah, blah. Beautiful. But the punished parent can't deal with the noisy child. And, and so it goes on. So then, the punishing parent instead would, would uh, let me read a book that teaches me how to control my child better. Or the punishing parent will go to the therapist and say, make me less angry because it's not good for my child. That's a very narrow, useful, useful, but very narrow uh, approach to healing a situation of relationship. A really fruitful thing is to say, well, how were you treated when you were your child's age? How were you treated when you were having your tantrums, for instance? Now you've got something. There's a developmental need that wants to continue. It wants to complete. I need to be in a place with a friend with whom I can be passionate like a toddler and that you, you, you don't judge me, punish me or shame me for that. Don't tell me I'm childish. It's not that I'm childish, it's that I'm trying to complete a story that was smashed for me when I was three, possibly quite brutally. That's honorable. 
And it's the same as what all of us are doing. Becoming conscious of that means that we don't overload our society with those needs or our husbands and wives or our children, etc., etc., friends. It means that we, we bring the right developmental should to that part of ourselves that's our childhood got arrested here. But if we feed that, there's a beautiful natural moving on that happens. What I love about it is that you don't need to try to grow. Trying usually happens because it's kind of like looking in the wrong place. There's a wave that comes. Now I'm going to use surfing analogies. Um, you ride the wave. If you all you need to do is know where to put your surfboard in the right place, and and you, you the wave carries you. There's a developmental wave. There's a natural, an experience that wants to happen. In the same way is that if you water a plant and give the right nitrogen to the soil, etc., what it needs. It's impossible for it not to grow and develop and develop. It's just what happens. Everywhere I go, people are saying to the, you know, they say bravo for the kids. You say be a big boy, be a big girl. Wait, they're gonna be big if they get the right nutrition. How about really enjoying them exactly where they are right now? Instead of congratulating them for getting bigger, why do we do that? Why do we push so hard? And you can bet all the money on the planet that as we push our children, that's exactly how we treat ourselves. Where we're shouting into our shirts, grow up, grow up every time that we, a need comes up. It's an awful way to treat ourselves. And then in a moment of great wisdom, where your heart opens and you expand afterwards, you go home and you congratulate yourself. Wow, I was growing up today, wasn't I? Here's some gold stars for your chart. <laughs> oh dear. So here's the last thing that I want to share then. Um, if hearing all of this, brings up a very alarming thought that, oh my God, the only way through is I have to go back to be a baby. I've got to be breastfed properly because I was only breastfed three months. I need to be, need to find somebody that'll breastfeed me for another three, three years. And, um, or I need to go to a place where I can throw my toys a lot and break things. Um, that's okay, my family loves me, they'll put up with that. I just need to do that for a couple of years until I complete my toddlerhood, get my degree. Um, the good thing is that that's not what we need to do. I've seen it, I've, I've, there are accounts of people doing that. Um, well and good, I could tell you stories, but we don't really live our lives by the screamingly unusual you know what's available beautifully and very very abundantly available for 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 the 99 percent of us 99.999 percent first of all the validation of the developmental need that comes up when you feel triggered and you go nuts and you're reacting to something that isn't the present moment. Good. When you take the time to notice the inner child trying to complete the growth, that's a love moment. The validation of that is, it's, it's a joy actually. It's such a relief. It's such a relief. We usually say things like, aha, or ah, no wonder. No wonder I'm reacting this way. I'm not stupid or crazy. My reactions aren't good for my friends. I know that, but no wonder I'm not a, this bad person. I'm, I, ah, no wonder my inner child is screaming for, for what he or she didn't get. Already, 
just that recognition and validation is it changes your gut biology it changes your brain chemistry it changes the rhythm of your heart changes your whole body it's already a nutrient already before you do the next thing validation real validation not validation out of a book and when that happens interpersonally that's a particularly beautiful moment you can do it for yourself but also you know you guys are, are, are i believe i think most of you all of you are health practitioners when you do that for another person and there's no need to fake it because when you actually see that the 35 year old adult who's behaving in a very strange manner sitting in front of you when you finally see aha that's a seven-year-old kid crying or that's a newborn baby freezing or whatever it might be you suddenly you can't help going ah oh, no wonder forgiveness that's what forgiveness is in my mind and forgiveness just you don't try it it comes from behind and floods you it is its own energy because you're in a human body and your cells recognize what's going on in the cells of the other person because you went through the same developmental stages and your body says ah oh, no wonder the words that will come from your mouth at that moment will i don't know what you're going to say but it's going to be beautiful for the other person in the room so validation and it's like the inner child or inner adolescent or inner baby goes oh finally somebody's heard me you know i've been making a havoc out of this person's relationships for 35 years until somebody would notice me and finally finally i'm being seen and heard oh my god that's glorious <laughs> because it is oh my god and then the heart does what the heart knows to do it happens automatically and there's more and i probably should finish talking soon but this is where it becomes so interesting then the the, the really creative and i think potentially quite fun sometimes side of developmental the developmental model of therapy in a child work is that we look inventively for, if more is necessary, what are ways that you can have that developmental need, whether you're inner adolescent, inner toddler, inner child, inner baby, et cetera. How, what is an adult appropriate way to say yes to that need? This is the kind of stuff that we explore and go into and have lots of examples for it when in the course that Kate can tell you about um, in my online practitioner training for inner child uh, dialogue, inner child journey, inner child dialogue, which we do at many levels. We can go very, very deep, like, like a deep regressive therapeutic uh, method or just like a very simple dialogue that happens in, 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 a, in a minute. There's a snorkeling or there's, or there's the scuba diving or the deep sea dive, many, many versions. And you'd be amazed how often just, just a little bit of talking, but in a way that honors and it has the inner child awareness, it's so transformative. And there are, I talk about it in terms of developmental nutrients. When we finally hear what your child, inner child is asking for on that day, how what are ways that you can have that in your life more it could involve so many things learning how to reach out you forgot to reach out you were ashamed for asking for help and we can we can have a exciting program now for trying that out going into your discomfort zone a little bit at a time and growing that we you turn it into like a practice of learning how to reach out in a way that you that was stopped for you um um and this is where things be can become quite behavioral you know i think this is the place where behavioral therapy has a real relevance 
in recognition that we we learn things you know in, with the plasticity of our neurology requires repetition it requires an enjoyable beautiful and safe practice in the same way that you don't meditate once or you don't do yoga once it is a practice that is in your life that if you're doing it in a way that's respectful to yourself most of the time you will be looking forward to that practice right it's not onerous you want to get to it um so there's so many things that we do. You know, some, look, I've run parenting courses, for instance, where the, like the baby in the adult is so desperately hungry and has been so unheld, like a gigantic deficit in holding. And that affects probably more than half of our world. And we say, well, why can't you have some of that? You don't have to be a baby, but the, you can go to that baby body memory of just being What's a baby? A person that doesn't act upon the world, but just receives. How can we make your helplessness a beautiful experience? And so you lie in a hammock and we gently rock you like a baby with a little encouragement to just let go of your head. And we might sing a lullaby or hum. What, what reaches you? What is best for you? What, what does your developmental play, template really respond to automatically, most deeply? And I've never seen something more gorgeous than a, a middle-aged person or older be, receiving that for the first time. Um, you can see where the body receives in a way that is nutritional. In that particular example, where the face looks like the Buddha, like this profound serenity, but a pleasured serenity. You can see it. It's just extraordinary. And you can extend that to all of the different developmental needs that we can have. You know, my definition of adulthood, half of what our adulthood is, just half, the other half is other stuff. Half of what our adulthood is involves completing what was incomplete in our childhoods and if that sounds really overwhelming but it often ends up being kind of simple you know my parents punish me for my sexual orientation well as an adult i'm going to go to places that support my sexual orientation and i get to live that 20 year old part of me that was had to die when I was 20. Doesn't that make sense? Um, if I do that consciously, then it's really safe and it works. You know, people that go and learn how to be assertive because that was crushed when they were seven or five, you know, etc, etc, etc. Learning how to be held, learning how to reach out, all of those functions that are developmental stages of the formative years. And yeah, there there is there's some creativity involved and how how can I how can I have that as an adult? Um, but it often doesn't take much. You don't need, you know, 18 months of being a baby 24 hours a day. What we need, and this is the fortunate thing, what we need is just knowing why we seemingly overreact and taking that as a signal. And you'll still overreact. You'll, you know, life sometimes presses buttons so big. And people say to me, I thought I dealt with that in therapy. I had a year of therapy. I thought I dealt with that. And now I, I'm mad at myself because those feelings came up again. I thought it was all over. Well, that's not how body memory works. It, um, as you grow and develop and expand and heal, it usually takes a much larger trigger to get you to regress that way. But life sometimes brings those larger triggers, like an illness that makes you, it strips your defenses or death in the family or something. Life does that. So not to be downhearted, but to just be recogni recognizing, validating. Ah, 
what's that? I feel really regressed right now. There's that baby crying in me. I need to, and but what did I do last time that made me feel better? That's right. I've been learning how to reach out, how to let somebody hold me. I've been learning that. And I will be untriggered when I let that happen. When I speak to someone I trust, I will be untriggered. In other words, we would continue to fall into those potholes on the road that will happen for the entire lifespan. But we get better and better at recognizing what is the need and how to fulfill it. So we can climb out of that pothole, as it were, more elegantly, more gracefully, sooner, right? I'm, I'm hoping that that's been meaningful to you and that, that I'm hoping you've enjoyed, enjoyed the story of the story of all of us. I think that's what it is. And I have no idea. I think I've run over time and I'm hoping, um, I feel guilty now because I get so absorbed in the story, I completely lose track of time every time. And I really wanted to hear some questions from you guys or uh, if you have burning questions, I'm, Kate, I'll be guided by your expert um, understanding of when everyone needs to finish and a um, couple of questions at least. Well, uh, I, if you have to go, of course, we understand. Uh, you have talked for over an hour, Robin. <laughs> yeah. I know you just wanted to talk for half an hour, but you... You definitely was an amazing stories and good news all around. Good examples, very good. And I'm sure there are a few people that would love to talk with you. So we're, we're here tonight. Anyone can ask a question if you have to leave. Please, I'm so glad you came. I'll be sending out the recording as soon as I can. Will the recordings include the questions and answers? Yes. Okay, I do want to give you guys opportunities to ask questions as much as I can. I know there's a lot of you. Um, and that if you do have to go and you have an appointment, etc., or you're just tired um, of listening, I, you know, that, do what you need to do and the recording will show you whatever bits you missed. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Tara Blasco, you've opened up your microphone. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Hi, Robin. It's really good to hear you. And I just have the question, if you can describe a little bit the course, the six, I think, I believe it's six weeks. So what's your plan, what you are planning to do? Thank you. Um, yeah, well, uh, the curriculum involves understanding the, uh, to some degree, understanding the, the, the biology, the the bodily processes, the neurological processes of why we regress, why we are triggered, the beauty of that system, how it works. And then we'll be looking at the developmental stages and understanding what the needs are, which gives you a really good frame of reference. We'll be learning how to read our own and our clients reactivities that we're not just saying, wow, that's negative thinking or that's, you're too angry or whatever, but we, we, we learning how to hear the, whatever that is, the screaming child, the angry adolescent, whatever that is on the inside in a developmental kind of a framework. And then um, I'll be teaching you how to, how to use, it's a step-by-step -step dialogue. There's an incredible simplicity to it. Um, where it can become complex is that sometimes there's a, you know, it's, there, there, are there are a couple of typical places where people get stuck, where if you say, you know, what did you need when that was going on for you as a child, there are good reasons why half of the time people will say, well, I've got no idea what I needed. So there are ways to help that. That's when the process becomes a little bit more complex. And then the, and then it's, the, the, the creative side is, you know, when you identify the developmental need that, that wants to be, go to the next stage of completion, how can we offer that for our clients as well as for ourselves um, in an adult appropriate manner, in a way that works for you? 
um, within the limitations of your life. Um, how to construct that is a lovely art. And um, finally is also learning to appreciate just how much in the present moment, the, the manner of our dialogue, not always, but so very often is the developmental nutrient itself. How often the validation already set some processes in place that are heart opening and where the child goes, oh, thank God, I finally feel seen and heard and, and met. When someone says, you know, I don't like how, you know, your violence and your rages, it's not that I enjoy being with that part of you, but God, I can understand how you, I can see through your story. No wonder you react that way. And guess what? That's pretty much the way that I react when I'm in a similar position. And that when that validation is true already, um, I love how, how much it's like we don't need to pull a rabbit out of a hat. We're under pressure as therapists about fixing and finding answers. And, and that's not appreciating enough of the impulses that are already inside you that once you find that recognition of where your client is at, you, 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 you want to say, gosh, I am you. In some ways, I am you. You are me. With I, I, so validation becomes almost like a reflex if you let that happen. Um, so that that I hope that answers your question. That's that's what we cover in level one. We're going to be working on level two. In level two, and there's a practicum. We will sometimes split and, and do some exercises and work with each other and look at the different levels of the inner child journey. Um, we, Kate and I are working on a level two for people that have graduated from level one. Um, in which it's more kind of supervisory because this gets really solid when we talk about live, real live experiences. So there's opportunities then uh, for people to say, look, I was working with my client and this is what happened and I wasn't sure. And, and we, we unpack all of that. And um, invariably, you know, it's our own growth at the same time that happens. We, we co-grow together. Our clients kind of bring these triggers for us in which we, we, we grow together like this. Um, I do also offer online supervision for small groups. That's the whole kind of package. There's a um, yeah, community on Facebook too, Inner Child Journeys, for people that have done the training with me and opportunities for dialogue and mutual support. And um, so, yeah, it's a international kind of community and young in terms of we've been at this for about a year or so and we're looking to grow it, let it have its own life. Thanks for your question, Tara. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Great. Okay, Joanna, you have a question? Hello. Uh, not so much of a question, but just to say hi, Robin. Hi, Kate. Hi, everybody. Um, hi. I did the training with Robin first time around when Robin delivered it the first time. Um, and I just wanted to let everybody know how it, it is fantastic. Um, I use it with my clients, but I've also used it profoundly for myself. So Robin, I had to uh, chuckle to myself when you mentioned the hammock, because I know that's something that you personally recommended to myself. And I thought you might like to know that I can now, because I couldn't get in it, I can now get in it and I can gently rock myself. And my, exactly, my, and my other developmental nutrient came into the room with me when I first started the talk and then when you started talking about different things that I could feel oh yeah I didn't get that as a child look who came and sat with me uh -huh. yeah so my kittens yeah. though not so much yeah kittens, were my developmental one of my developmental nutrient and I can see Kate smiling because she'll know what that means um to me so um yeah look I just rather than a question just thought I'd come in and share how profound 
it has made um, by doing your training has actually done for myself and how that now has the ability to translate, not just in the way that I work with clients in being able to practice, but also how that makes me in my central nervous system. So thank you. Oh. Joanna, thank you. I, I, love, I love how our companion animals, they bring us perfect and absolute freedom from any of the judgment, abandonment, shaming, in, in which in that bubble of our interaction with our animals, we finally find permission to, to surrender to the pleasure of contact. We fold into each other physically. We caress. And that, that was lost to us with other human beings. And, 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 and our cats and our dogs, etc. they bring us this perfect permission and we pick up on that. And, and of course, that's a developmental nutrient. You know, it was a very interesting. I love automatically, automatically, we just fold into that, you know. Uh, when, when that says a lot for the developmental template, that when our bodies recognize the developmental nutrient in the environment, we, we tend to start opening up to that quite soon. It's almost automatic. Ah, sometimes it takes a while, you know, the fear comes up. Am I allowed to have this? before somebody punishes me or uh, takes it away but um anyway yeah your cat's doing a wonderful job and uh and thanks for thanks yeah. for your your share thanks this, for what you said the experience with those was very interesting because i lost in very in a quick nutshell we found a cat that had been injured and it really triggered me and i didn't we couldn't work out whether it was the fact that it had been injured and I had injuries as a, as a kid, what it was. Um, and then I read but different things. We, you know, I kept working on it and different things. And then one night I remember waking up and I heard your voice say, Joe, there's your developmental nutrient. And I knew I needed an animal because I never had an animal as a kid. And I wanted, you know, I, a, a, being an only child, an animal would have, I'm sure would have made a difference. So um, yeah. So everybody, um, Highly recommend. recommend <laughs> it. That's it's good you said yes, Joe. I'll say. Um, hubby, and, and look, yeah. uh, you know, the fact that Hubby's done this journey with me is um, is also good because it meant that you know he understood completely. Um, yeah. Why? Well, saying, okay, we need to do this. And, uh, uh, I'll say this to everybody. That's why that's one of the big drivers for me of doing this kind of work in groups. That, that I know that it, when we have community around us that is inner child aware, it makes everything flow so much better when we're not just working alone, when we have recognition of each other's kind of rhythms. It works so much, you know, it, it's amazing for couples therapy when instead of just blindly engaging in the, in the conflict, but to, to have a deep understanding of not just our own, but each other's developmental story and, the, and where, where the triggers are, you know, then you realize it's not you I'm fighting. I'm fighting with some aspect of my own past and you're reacting to an aspect of your own past. And now a really good conversation can be had. So, you know, the, the inner child aware community or inner child aware culture is the, to me, the, the great longing, the great desire that I want to see that happen more and more and more. Thankfully, I'm by far not the only person that does this kind of thing. Um, I just like my method. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> but we all like our own method. <laughs> yes, and you have a good method, Robin. And it's really easy to learn. Cool. Uh, yeah. So, um, M M M, did you want to ask your question? You put one in the um, in the chat, and I'm happy to have you come on. And I see Mer Baka, I see you there. So, did you want to come on, back, um, M M, and ask your question? So M M asked you a question, Robin. What types of therapy would you recommend for healing developmental trauma? Many. Because 
because um, it, the therapy needs to, it isn't therapeutic if it doesn't answer what the developmental need is. So developmental trauma stretches from, you know, being in, in, the, in the womb of a, of a mum who's deeply conflicted through to different themes and more different themes and more different themes all the way through to an adolescent who is not allowed to choose their own vocation and is forced to study things that they don't believe in and which is a developmental trauma absolutely uh, i mean and don't underestimate that it, it hurts people for a long time um so there isn't You know, the only unitary thing that I have to say is that the thing, the, 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 the one constant across the board is listen to what the need is. Now you know what the therapy needs to be. And in my word, in, in my thinking, therapy is helping the person to fulfill that incompletely met developmental need. So sometimes it's about holding. Sometimes it's about, you know, mentorship, helping people to find a vocation that's true to their passion. That's an adolescent kind of a thing. Sometimes it's about helping people to assert their, their, their needs and feelings. Uh, sometimes it's helping people how to have a boundary when they were never allowed to say no. It, it's, it's about what the need is that's being triggered up. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Uh, okay, Baka, what, what would you like to ask your question? I was just curious how um, Robin's approach is uh, similar or, or either complementary or different than other types of um, inner child work, like specifically internal family systems. Um, and like, are you accepting of like a more multiple like inner children <laughs> approach? And I was curious also if you have any more influence in your work of, of a systemic approach, like a systems theory incorporation behind your practice. Um. Those are really great questions and thank you for asking. Uh, yeah, there's a lot I wanna to say to that. Um, it's a challenge to be brief about those questions because they're huge questions. See if I remember everything that you asked. First of all, I'm, 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 ex I'm feeling a bit of regret that I called my book Inner Child because what I, what I began to realize after it was too late and the book's published there's so much inner child therapy around the world and it means such incredibly different things that I'm, I'm really worried about, you know, what people expect it to mean when they see the cover. And it probably hasn't done me any favors. I wish I'd called it, you know, sequential developmental relational healing or something like that, and something else. Um, because I don't know, I think a lot of, People go to do inner child workshops and there's an instruction that you, you know, you, you pick an animal and you, you act like the animal and you get on your, on the carpet and roar like a lion or things, you know, that are prescribed in a particular way. All of that is really cool. All of the psychodrama of that is really, really cool. And I've done quite a bit of that, but, but this, this is so not that it's definitely not about you, you know, the, the, the kind of the, go be more childlike. I don't know what you should go be. It's, it's about really, I love how indigenous people are brilliant at reading the weather, much better than the, than the Bureau of Meteorology, much better than the app on your phone. Why is that? Because they go into this really empty state of deep listening and deep deep, very passive observation of things in your environment that give you signals. 
I love that about indigenous elders, wise people. That's what my image of what listening really means. That's what, that's the navigator for my inner child work. How, you know, you listen to the signals in your body that are speaking very, very eloquently about your inner child needs. And then growth isn't prescribed, it happens. Put water in a plant and it'll go up. It's what happens. You, you expand into more of your adult self. You become more adult through listening and responding to your inner child when the inner child calls. Your inner child is not calling all of the time. This is not the answer to the, the, it's when you're triggered and regressed. That's when I do inner child work. It certainly is not the only thing to do. Okay. And um, I'm informed by my first in-depth training was somatic. You know, the Neo Reichen, Neo Alexander Lowen and the similar, um, which was a wonderful learn about, uh, way to learn about developmental child development because it was development as it is seen in the body, the body mind. Um, that was my probably the biggest chapter in my learning, and I and I have a huge appreciation for family systems theory. That becomes that's embedded as part of the developmental story in my mind all of the time. That um, that's part of our developmental story. What what happened between us and our siblings, and how we migrate to opposite corners. You know, that one sibling takes up the role of being the one that does all of the shouting and the complaining and the protesting. This sibling then marries, uh, migrates to this corner of just shutting down and going very quiet. And th those are systemic things that deeply impact our development. But the, the inner child work then is identical. We go back to how that happened. And then you don't have to look for this. It's already in your body that part of you that longs to complete, you know, if you were in this corner, that there's a part of you, your body longs to expand into the other corners of the room and to inhabit those other parts of yourself. And it will never stop longing until those opportunities come. So I don't know what you mean about multiple inner children, but I do, um, I'll see if this answers that question. The image that I put in my book is the emotional age elevator. There's an emotional the elevator, like the lift that goes up and down in a building. You're a building, in my metaphor. The ground floor is your birth in the, in the year of your birth. The basement is your time in the womb. There's no building without a basement. That's part of the building. Every floor is one year of your age. The top floor, the penthouse apartment, is the age that you are now. By the way, the building's not done. And I hope that you get to enjoy a building that's roughly 120 floors high this lifetime. The thing is that the lift, the elevator, is traveling up and down many, many times every day. And you are at the emotional age of the floor that you get off at. And there is purpose. Sometimes the, you know, and I love the metaphor because life presses a button. When life presses the number three button, you travel down to the third floor and you get out on that floor looking for what you needed as a three-year-old that didn't come. And the more that you do that in a safe and creative adult appropriate manner, you, that button won't be pressed as, as, as often, but you know, but there are times when you want to travel, you press your own button, you want to travel down to, to claim the 
enormous developmental advantage that three-year-olds have of knowing how to take risks, knowing how to see something for the first time. We need, sometimes we must press our own buttons and go down, not to complete a developmental picture, but to retrieve a very powerful faculty that belongs to that time. I'll give you another example. When I meditate, and I sit down to meditate, and I'm in a meditative space, it feels like I've pressed the number one button or the basement button. Because my loveliest meditations are when I enter a space in which nothing that I see around me has a history to it. Everything is for the first time. And I see that in babies. I, I had moments of that as a baby. I, it serves me to retrieve that. Do you understand? So it's not the, the regression often has an importance that is not necessarily about completing an unmet need. You want that stuff. You want what you had at 15, because if you're like most people at 15, you were more outspoken than you, than you were, than you've ever been. Sometimes you need that. And to reclaim that faculty without being consumed by all of the despair of 15-ness, that's a cool thing to do. Press the 15th floor, get out, take what you need, and go back to your age now and, and use that. Right? I, I don't know if I've answered all your questions, but I hope I came close to that. You good there, Baka? Okay. All right, well, it, it, it is getting late here, Robin. So we we'll probably need to come to a closure. You could probably um, answer questions yeah. all night, huh? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, uh, well, uh, we'll sign off. Any, what I've said is in my book and you can find my book online uh, as a, Single book or paperback in the, on, the usual online stores, <clears throat> or you know, join us. Uh, there's still spaces, I believe, in our next online course. And Kate, you can tell people where to find that. Yes, I'll email everybody the recording and the link so you can look at things. Yeah. And Robin's very, very generous in providing the, the table of developmental needs and some of the uh, more descriptions of his journeying technique so i'll send you those links as well and hopefully you'll join us uh, we start in may right may 5th is yeah our first our first class well it's may 5th in the united states yeah it's may 6th in in other parts of this confusing planet <laughs> well thank you so much robin grill you've been in just great form tonight. See, everyone's clapping. And um, we will, uh, we'll see you all when we can, when we will. And um, Robin, we'll see you in May. Yeah, I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Thank you very, mm. very much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed speaking with you guys. I really, really appreciate your, your coming along and your presence. And I hope to see you again. Thank you both yeah. so much. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Your Thanks pleasure. for coming right. and turn on your Thank microphone you. as you leave. Say goodbye because I love to hear your voice. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank goodbye, you. Anna. It was Robin. so good to see you all. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Kate. Good night. Thank you, Robin. Thank you.